Welcome to Hard Talk. I'm Stephen Sacker. In recent years, there's been plenty of often heated debate about the relationship between Islam and extremism. Much of the fiercest commentary has come from outside the faith. But increasingly, there are calls for change from within the Muslim community. My guest today has one of the most controversial voices in that internal debate. Rahil Raza is a Pakistani-born Canadian human rights activist who co-founded the Muslim Reform Movement. How many Muslims are ready to talk her language? Rahil Raza, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. You use the language of war. A couple of years ago, you wrote Canada is under attack. Who is the enemy as far as you're concerned? Well, the enemy is the radical extremists, uh, the jihadists, who have declared war against the West. It's not just me saying it. You have ISIS, the Taliban, the uh, Wahhabis, uh, they have said that they are against Western values and they will destroy the West in any way that they can. And we have seen the results of that. All you have to do is uh, take a look at what has happened across the world from Madrid to Brussels to, uh, to Ottawa to Paris. Uh, you know, it's, it's all there. San Bernardino uh, was the time that we actually were sitting and working on the Muslim reform movement the night that San Bernardino happened. Right, I suppose the interesting thing though is that you talk not as though there are just a, a, a few hundred hardcore uh, men, maybe women too, of violence. You talk as though this is an enemy which incorporates anyone who is a believer in political Islam, in Sharia law. You seem to believe that all of those Muslims are the enemy. What I have said and what I believe is that political Islam is the enemy and therefore we call it Islamism and it's entirely opposed to spiritual Islam which is what I follow. It is the difference between the Islam of the Mullah and the Islam of Allah and I follow the Islam of Allah. I am a Muslim as well. But political Islam has a purpose and the purpose is hegemony over the rest of the world the and language the rest you of say, the Muslims. Yeah, the language of political Islam is embedded, embedded with terrorist propaganda. It is. And you just have to connect the dots to see that this is what they have used. They have used violence as their tool to force their form of Islam, not only on non-Muslims, but on other Muslims as well. Do you go as far as Ayan Hirsi Ali, for example, the Somali-born writer, uh, activist, who says, and this is a direct quote, Islamic violence that's what she calls it. Not Islamist violence, but Islamic violence is rooted not in social, economic or political conditions or even in theological error, but rather in the very foundation texts of Islam itself. I don't agree with Ayan Hussi Ali. We come from, on, on some issues, on some issues she's absolutely on the dot, but we come from two different places. She is an ex-Muslim, I am a Muslim, I'm a Sunni Muslim, I'm an observant Muslim, and I want to bring about change from within the faith. So I believe that political Islam, Islamism is an ideology that has been promoted on the backs of billions of petrodollars from uh, both the Wahhabi side as well as through Khomeiniism and the Muslim Brotherhood. And these are the three prongs of the triangle which are a danger to spiritual Islam. Some would say that Ayan Hirsi Ali is maybe more honest than you. You know, she's, she's moved away from her, the faith of her family altogether. She wrote a book called Heretic, but clearly she is no longer defining herself as a Muslim. You are. You claim you are a Muslim and yet so many of the words you issue suggests to me that you have the most fundamental problems with the faith that you say you adhere to. I have problems with Muslims, not with Islam. I have problems with the may, way Muslims interpret, understand and implement the faith in their lives. 
uh, I am a follower of my faith. So yes, there are questions and there we evolve to a point where we need to look at our uh, scripture and our faith and decide that there's some stuff that we need to leave behind in the seventh century. How, how and well that's do you part know the, the, the scripture? How well do you know the Quran? I mean, uh, as I, I understand it, you were educated in Catholic school in Pakistan. <laughs> I, 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 yes, it's a serious I question. How, yes. to, to, to get deep yes. into what Islam is, what it should be, yes. do you not need to be extraordinarily well based in, in the scriptures and in the Quran itself? I'm not a Quranic scholar. One doesn't have to be a Quranic scholar to read the Quran and understand it. And I have read it, many interpre interpretations, many understandings. I'm reading this new study Quran, which uh, gives the historical context. And I think that one of the biggest problems for Muslims and non-Muslims is uh, trying to understand the Quran without historical context and also appreciating that it's not in a chronological order. So it's not an easy book to read. So when you're talking Sharia, for example, you're confident that you can hold your own, theologically speaking, with, for example, some of the lead scholars uh, in Al-Azhar, in Cairo, one of the great uh, institutions of Islamic scholarship? Absolutely not. I am, as I said, not an Islamic scholar. I'm an activist. But what I do know about Sharia is that it's, when it's mentioned in the Quran, it means ethical and moral guidance. And it's a personal way of governing ourselves, which we do. But I also say in our Muslim reform movement and as our organization Muslims Facing Tomorrow that we don't want Sharia as a form of governance where we live in the West because Muslims themselves have not been able to quite figure out what it is and which school of thought they want to follow. So I, 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 just, I guess in a way it's a, I, the question I'm asking is one of credibility. Do you think for most Muslims around the world you and your message carries real depth and credibility? Well, that's hard to say because it's they who have to decide. What I know is that I have the credibility as a Muslim who knows my faith, who's a practicing, believing Muslim to understand that the Islam I see today is not the Islam I grew up with. I grew up in an Islam that was compassionate and merciful and uh, totally respectful of diversity within the faith. I grew up in a different Pakistan and a different Islam. And I have seen it go downhill. I have seen how it has been politicized. This is not rocket science. I mean, we see it in our everyday life. Well, you talk so, of diversity. It just strikes me that there's diversity even within political Islam. You know, we began with you telling me that as far as you're concerned, political Islam is the problem. I've reported from many different Muslim countries and met many different brands of political Islam. I'm just thinking now of my conversations uh, with Rashid Ghanoushi in Tunisia, a man who held the reins of power after the Arab Spring, a man who himself was committed to Sharia, but who, when he was in effect leading Tunisia, did not impose his will on the nation undemocratically. He worked with secular parties and when the voice of the people through elections was that they no longer, no longer wanted an actor in power, he left power. The key word that you used was imposition. What we don't want is imposition of anyone on the way we practice our faith. There's 1.7 billion Muslims in the world today. They practice their faith in a way that appeals to them. It's their direct connection with the Creator. So in some ways, there's 1.7 billion forms of practicing the faith. When we are in the public square, though, and that is when, where it counts, we don't want to impose our version of Islam on anyone else. And this is what is happening through this boxed and packaged Islam that is being exported through the Wahhabis or through the Khomeinis or through the Muslim but, Brotherhood. But with respect, you're imposing and stereotyping too. Not so long ago, you used this phrase which struck me as extraordinarily stereotyping. You talked about the Muslim reform movement sending a message to, quote, Generation Jihad. Well, that's just putting a, a label on an entire generation of Muslims. It's not putting a label, actually. What it is doing is suggesting to them that they need to move into the 21st century. The Muslim reform movement is a declaration that says that Muslims would like to come into the, seventh, into the 21st century as opposed to living under a caliphate in the 7th century. And it is a message to our youth because they are the future of tomorrow. And they are the ones who are being radicalized even to go and fight with ISIS. So obviously they're getting a counter narrative from somewhere else. The Muslim reform movement wants to produce this narrative. It is not imposing it on them, but it has a declaration that says that this is what we are looking at if we want to reform. And we want to reform the way Muslims implement and practice their faith. We are not looking to imp 
uh, reform the faith itself. We're not looking to reform Islam. That's why we call it the Muslim reform movement. You're saying we're not looking to impose. We are simply looking to develop a new way of thinking for Muslim people. Yes. You're Canadian now. You've been Canadian for a long time. 27 I, years. I, I'm assuming you, you embrace the values of Canada, including tolerance, openness, free expression, democracy, all of those things. Yes, that's why we came to Canada. And yet, if you don't mind me saying, you appear personally to be extraordinarily intolerant of certain forms of expression inside Canada today. Well, one should always be intolerant of hate, shouldn't you? Well, I'm we not necessarily be... talking about hate. I'm talking, for example, about um, the what's called the niqab, the full face veil that some, a very few, but some Muslim women want to wear in Canada, just as they do in parts of Europe and elsewhere, certainly in the in the Muslim nations of the world, you have declared that it is entirely unacceptable and that Canada must ban it. Well, it was actually originally Jack Straw who put the cat among the pigeons right here, starting with the issue about the niqab. But yes, I did a lot of research and study on it. And I didn't wage a jihad against the niqab. It was a suggestion to the government and showing our concerns. You wanted out speak it. I wanted banned, yes, because first of all, the people who are pushing for the niqab are pushing on the basis of religious freedom when it is not a religious requirement, and that's not well, me saying. Surely they're pushing on the basis of freedom, because many of, of the people pushing well, no, many freedom. of the people pushing hardest against your edict that it should be banned are yes. not Muslims at all. They're just defenders of free expression and human rights. Yes, I mean, I'm thinking of we, in this country, mm, in the UK, Shami Chakrabarti, who for a long time headed up the Liberty Group, yes. and who said that this was a, a fundamental question of. of freedom it was nothing to do with religion it was actually yes to do with but freedom. when we weigh these freedoms against the safety and security of the country and the niqab is a security issue it is a health issue it is a ghettoization issue it is a communication issue and so we studied this and wrote a letter with five points to the previous government who then banned the niqab at uh, citizenship ceremonies but the later government then reneged on that and they have brought uh, turned it around. And this is what a democracy is about, is to express a concern, to have debate and discussion, and to decide what is best both for the country and for the community. Do you not worry that you are in, maybe inadvertently, fueling a form of racism or Islamophobia? This is what Shami Chakrabarti went on to say. She said this issue has nothing to do with gender equality. It has everything to do with rising racism in Western Europe. She was referring to the ban in France. She said, how are you liberating women by criminalizing their clothing? Can you answer that question? Well, racism and bigotry has existed long before the niqab issue was on the table. And racism and bigotry You don't want to exists. fuel it, do you? At least no. of all, as a Muslim woman. I don't think that what I say or do fuels racism and bigotry. What fuels racism and bigotry is when Muslims don't address the issues head on. There was a poll done in Canada in which more than 52% of Canadians said they do, do not like the face covering, which they consider a mask. So this is what the average Canadians are saying. Thing. But if no one's discussing or debating the issue, if it's not brought out into the public, that is when people have a knee-jerk reaction. But it's not I good quoting the uh, polling evidence about what a majority of Muslims, uh, of, of Canadians think. I mean, you know, there is such a thing as the tyranny of the majority. The, the need when it comes to defending freedoms is to defend the freedoms of minorities, of even of individuals. That's the whole essence of arguments about freedom. And in Canada, surely Muslim women, the very few of them who want to wear the full face, fail should have that right. It's, it's, a, it's a Canadian value, isn't it? It is, but a Canadian value is also the accountability and credibility and the safety and security of Canada, to me, comes first. And this is the main issue here that we are talking well, about. Well, you and see, so that the problem with arguing about security, and I guess we've seen this in your southern neighbour, the United States, recently, with yeah. the, the declarations of Donald Trump, is that you can use the security argument to develop all sorts of propositions which appear to undermine freedoms. You're going in that direction yourself. You've argued for restrictions on immigration from what you call terror-producing countries. Can you define for me what is a terror-producing country? A country where radicals are trained, where they have... Where Muslims uh, live. Uh, where Muslims live, really? yes. So, yes, so Muslim nations are terror-producing? Not, not all, but there are some. I mean, I come from Pakistan. I know that there are training camps for radicals, and I also know for a fact there are Canadian youth that had gone there and taken training, and they had come back. So this is not something that 
that's rocket science. We know for a fact that there are some countries in which there is training for radicals so that to be, takes place. To be clear about it, you seriously want your own government in Canada to put a moratorium on all immigration from Muslim countries? Until they can sort out the problem. So you have to understand that in the work that we do, both with security and the government, we have discovered that it's the extremists and the jihadists are not just living outside the Western countries, they're right there as well. And they have come as immigrants maybe or, or as visitors. What we need to do is clean up what is happening inside and moratorium meant not a ban but just temporarily so they could well, we it can, is a ban, we it's a ban for a, a, for, for, a limited for a amount limited of time amount which you refuse to define. I mean you, you're, you're sounding an awful lot like Donald Trump. Do you embrace that, that comparison? No, but in a different way. He has a crude way of saying it, but I guess I will stand behind what I say, that we do need to do that. We need to do that again for... Do you think that would, for one second, stand up in a Canadian court of law, the notion of banning all immigration from Muslim nations? I'm not trying to make this into a legal issue. I don't have to <laughs> go to court, point about court Canada. for it. Canada is a country of laws yes, where the independence of the courts is one of the most central pillars yes, of your I democracy. Yes, but I put this idea out so that we can debate and discuss this in public. Maybe in a democracy they will decide it's not good for Canada and that's fine. I'm not a government official, I'm not a policy maker, I'm a grassroots activist. My job is to light a fire under the feet of our leaders and our religious leaders to bring about change. Well, the I current think... status quo is not something that I want my future generations of children and grandchildren to live with. But lighting fires is a dangerous activity because you end up burning things, perhaps things of value, including trust. Another of your propositions, close all mosques for three months to have intense scrutiny on the imams and their sermons. This, you say, is not an abuse of religious freedom, it's simply to ensure that religion can be free. Again, would that stand up for a moment in a Canadian court of law? Perhaps if pushes come to shoves, it might. We have gone to mosques and heard hate speech there. We have gone to mosques and heard but not speech every about mosque. You're suggesting closing all mosques for three months just in case one or two of them have uh, had imams preaching. It's not one or two. It's not one or two. It's much more than one or two. Let me assure you that many of the messages of us and them, many of the messages of disloyalty to the land in which we live, many of the messages of hate, have come from the mosque pulpit and from the Islamic institutions. So closing a mosque for three months is not a problem. For Muslims, they don't have to go and pray in a mosque. They can offer their five times prayers anywhere, anytime, but any place. Rihal Raza, we, we, in the United Kingdom and many other countries, there is a similar debate about how best to uh, work with Muslim communities to ensure that extremism, where it is present, is rooted out. Do you think that your approach is going to build bridges, is going to reach out and win the confidence of Muslim communities, or is it simply going to foster mistrust and even hatred? You'll be surprised to know how many Muslims actually follow what I say and are part of this movement. They are interested in bringing about change, and if it means closing mosques for three months, it's not the end of the world. It may solve the problem. Really? There are many, tell me, uh, how many Muslims in Canada have responded positively to the idea that all mosques be closed for three months? Dozens have. They have, Do uh, well, I mean, I mean people, there are what, more people, than a million people, Muslims in Canada, I so dozens have supported I don't you. do a poll after my... Um, what I write. I don't do a poll to see how Muslims are feeling about it. There's too much important work to do in exposing the ideology of the Islamists who are much faster than we are, who are growing faster than we are, whereas we're in a situation where we can't even use the terminology that this is stemming from some form of the uh, misuse of the faith. So we have to have the dialogue, we have to have the discussion. And that's what I do, is put it out there so we can have this conversation. Well, you put it out there and you say that you like to light fires. I'm just wondering how effective it is. I mean, one other issue which you've made a big uh, stand on and which, again, I'd like to hear whether you feel it's been effective is your, your insistence that in your version of a reformed Islam, uh, women should be free to preach in the mosque and indeed they should be free to preach not just to women but to mixed groups as well, that, uh, essentially to get rid of gender demarcation inside the mosque. You have on occasion 
preached yourself to mixed groups. Do you have any leverage for your message, do you think? Yes. Everything that I do and everything that I did has a reason for it. I led the mixed gender prayer not because I wanted to become an imam or take over the job of an imam. I did it because there was an appalling lack of gender equality in the mosques. It was a men's club. The women were relegated to the basement and sometimes if there were no space they couldn't even come and pray there. So the message was to say that we are spiritually equal. This is what my faith tells me. And it did have an effect. A month after I led the prayers, the mosques, two mosques, gave out uh, press statements and press releases saying that they would look into this gender issue and they would make sure that the women could, could come into the main section. Today, there is a women's only mosque in Copenhagen. There's one right here, an inclusive mosque initiative in London. There's one in Los Angeles. And when I get the funding, I hope to have one in Canada. So there is a rollover uh, effect. There may be a knee-jerk reaction to begin with. But in the end, people talk about it, and nobody, there is change. Nobody could accuse you of not taking these issues head on and challenging Muslims around the world. And you've taken your movement from Canada into an international context. But it comes at a price. There are people who want to shut you up. Of course. How frightened do you feel by some of the reaction you get? I don't think about it. And the irony is that when they call with death threats or hate you know, uh, call me to profess how much they hate me. They never leave a phone number where I could call them back to have a debate or a discussion. But it's you get death threats? Yes, I have had a death threat. I have Is it a serious? I mean, have you talked to the police about these things? The police in Canada know about it. Uh, I have uh, a, a fatwa, and, and that's okay because there's uh, bound sorry, to be who, who a reaction. Who issued a fatwa? A Saudi cleric. Is it credible? I mean, have you looked into that? I mean, it is credible. Again, fatwa here is credible. you sit smiling at me and suggesting that you can live with this, but we know from Salman Rushdie and, and others too that when well, this fatwas is a, are issued, they're serious business. Yes, but here's the difference. It's all about the money. The fatwa and Salman Rushdie's head comes on the backs of a lot of money. Mine is just people calling to say that they don't like me. Now, if they want to get rid of me, if they want to kill me and bury me, they can't bury the issues. So the issues have to be talked about. And if I allow myself to be frightened, I won't be able to speak out. I just and wonder so whether sometimes you embrace, you know, you said this in 2014, you said, I have the honor of being the recipient of death threats, of fatwa, hate mail. My name, I believe, is number six on a list of the most hated Muslims in the world, according to one blog, and I plan to become number one. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're loving this in a way. It's okay, it's there. I may as well embrace it. I'm not going to stop saying what I do. I'm not going to stop writing what I do. I want to push the envelope so Muslims all over the world can start talking about these issues. They don't have to like what I say. I gave up being popular a long time ago. What I want to do is follow truth and justice, which is what my faith tells me to do, and then let people you, work it out. You are ultimately still a Muslim. Unlike Ayan Hirsi Ali, you remain inside the faith. Yes. Do you not worry that uh, as more and more politicians and activists, many on the far right, it has to be said, uh, talk about Muslims in the way that you've talked about political Islam, connecting all the time to terrorism, do you not worry that there is a significant rise in Islamophobia? We see it in the United Kingdom, we've seen it in France. You could be accused of fostering that yourself. Well, I'm Muslim, so obviously I speak from within the faith. And I believe that it's not just about speaking to the converted. I speak in places where there is a lot of hate against Muslims. And I feel that when they hear a Muslim speak out, it changes the dynamics, and therefore I prefer to keep on speaking. Yes, there is racism and bigotry. I will not deny that. It existed before 9-11. It exists now, and we have to tackle that head on. It's a terrible thing to have racism and bigotry. However, what I say does not necessarily fan the flames of racism because people appreciate Muslims speaking out about the reality of the issues. We have to end there, but Rihal Raza, thank you so much for being on Hard Talk. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed.